Um, how many of you guys in here, I uh, think we've had this, let, I've asked this question before, but who in here likes music? Anybody? All right, I think that's a, that's a universal, right? It, it goes across the board that everybody likes music of some kind. And so uh, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning is music. And there's a guy that I had never heard of, but I thought this was interesting that uh, um, we got a chance to, let me go back here. This guy, Oliver Sacks, and he has this book that he wrote, and it's basically a Philea is a lover of music, right? So um, this is a guy that absolutely loves music. He has studied it. He has written books about it. But listen to what he says. One does not need to have any formal knowledge of music, nor indeed to be particularly musical, to enjoy music and to respond to it at the deepest levels. Music is part of being human. And there is no human culture in which it is not highly developed and esteemed. Now, if you didn't understand what all of that means is, you don't have to study music to appreciate music. You might know nothing about notes and melody and harmony and all of those kind of things, and yet you can appreciate music. And this goes across cultures. Throughout time, we read about music and even musical instruments all the way back to Genesis, that music is a part of being human. And so I'm going to have several quotes by this guy, Oliver Sacks, but listen to this quote. He says, music can move us to the heights or the depths of emotion. How many of us can, some music makes me feel so super high and then some music makes me feel super low, right? And, and so is it the music that affects the emotion or is the emotion that affects the type of music that I listen to, right? That there's sometimes that, that uh, I want to get hyped for it to working out, you know, and so I listen to a certain kind of music, but sometimes I don't feel so good. So I want some chill music or some just music that is, is melancholy. Is that the word that, uh, that, that you think about? But it moves, music can move us. It can persuade us to buy something, remind us of our first date. It can lift us out of depression when nothing else can. I don't necessarily agree with all of that, but it still has an ability. It can get us dancing to its beat, but the power of music, this is what I want us to think about. The power of music goes much, much further. Indeed, music occupies more areas of our brain than language does. Humans are a musical species. So basically what he's saying is, you know how we say you have a right brain and a left brain, and if you're more creative or if you're more hands, you know, there's just like they explain the different parts of the brain. But music ties them. It's really, and they said that when you play musical instruments or when you sing, it affects other parts because, you know, there's a speaking part of your brain, a listening part of your brain. Music goes into all of these parts of the brain. It, it, besides just speaking to one another, it really has a way of affecting it. We are a musical being. I think that's amazing as we, as we think about it. All of us, he says, have experienced, here's another part, so I, music moves us, our emotions and things like that. But here's another aspect. All of us have experienced the involuntary, helpless mental replaying of songs or tunes. Anybody? You know those catchy songs or the annoying songs that it just keeps playing over and over in your head. I don't want to start one because you may start singing it and you'll be distracted. But uh, uh, it's replaying of songs or tunes, snatches of music we've just even been exposed to by chance, even perhaps without even listening consciously. Sometimes you hear something in the background, like you're at the store, and then you're humming it as you're walking out, and you're like, when did I hear that song? Where did that song come from? Because I just heard it in the background. I just happened to hear it in the background, but yet it gets stuck in my head. Music has this ability to stick. 
It teaches us. You know, if you guys think about, if I told you to memorize um, 24, I think it's 24 letters in a row. Like I had to say, you have to memorize these letters and say them in a row. You'd be like, whoa, 24 in a row. But if you put it to music like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, right? Then what happens, you're able to memorize it. What if I told you to memorize 66 books of the Bible? Be like, oh man, I don't know. But if you could start putting it to music, and the New Testament is a little bit more familiar, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts in the letter to the Romans, right? So I can put that to music, and then what does it do? It sticks, right? It, it, it starts to stick in my mind because words and music it has an ability to attach itself to multiple parts of the brain. Whereas if I'm just trying to remember facts, it's harder to pull that out of my file cabinet, out of my brain. Like it's like, oh man, what was that again? But if I have music attached to it, then it's a little bit easier. You see, music teaches us. It's very powerful in its ability to, to share information. Here's another one. It says that uh, Dr. Sachs tells the story of a musician. So this guy was a musician. His name was uh, Clive Waring, but he suffered a devastating brain infection. So he got a brain infection and it, and it just devastated his memory. He was unable to retain any impression or memory of anything for more than a blink. Like he could remember it and then it was gone. You know, his memory was there for just a second and then it would disappear. This brain infection affected all of his past memories. However, Mr. Ray Waring was, he was also unable to remember almost his entire past, but he could play pieces of music on the piano from memory. And he could sing it by his mouth, the melodies while conducting a choir. How is that possible? He couldn't remember anything, but he could recite, he could play entire chord, like just this whole songs, and he could sing it. How is that possible? Because there's something about music that goes deep inside that is able to, to touch us. How many of you guys have seen maybe the YouTube videos where somebody has Alzheimer's or they're, they're just kind of sitting there in a nursing home and they, they can't talk? but then they'll play an old song and it's like they come alive and, and some of them will start to sing it. Whereas you, you couldn't ask them like who I am. They, they don't know who you are. And yet you recall a song from when they were kids. It's like, how is that possible? There is a power in music. There is a power to to embed knowledge and information that helps us to memorize things. And I promise you, those things will stay with you for generations. You know, there's, there's stuff that uh, they are saying that people will, will memorize uh, Amazing Grace. I was asked to do a funeral one time, and it, it was up on the reservation, and, and uh, this family, they said, hey, we don't know if he ever went to church, but uh, we, we don't go to church ourselves. But in his wallet, we found these words, and it was all the lyrics to Amazing Grace. And they said, to the best of our knowledge, he never went to church, but in his wallet was all these words to Amazing Grace. Music, it has an ability to touch us to shape us, to mold us. And so if you look at this, the third point that I wanted to share with this is number one, music can move us. Number two, music can be memorized, help us to memorize. And number three, it can unite us. There's a guy by the name of Anthony Storr. He wrote a book called Music and the Mind. And he stresses that in all societies, this is not just white or black or brown or American. This is in all societies. A primary function of music is collective and communal. That means it brings and binds people together. 
What makes a culture, one of the most valuable parts of a culture is what? Music. Music binds us. People sing together. They dance together in all cultures. You know, I've been to the Philippines. I've been to Africa. I've been to uh, Mexico. I've been to Australia. I mean, wherever you go, it's amazing how there's music and people will sing and they will dance and they have their own way of, of doing these things. It says this primal role of music is to some extent lost today. He's talking about America, especially. To some extent, the music is lost today when we have a special class of composers and performers, and the rest of us are often reduced to passive listeners. You see, what happens sometimes is in the, if you go back in time, you'd have these little communities, and there was a wedding. They would all sing and they would celebrate and it, it brought them together. They would all participate in singing. But now as you say, well, we want the best of the best to be our singers. And then we tend to step back and just enjoy them. You see, this is happening in the churches as well. That People will say, oh, they're the best at singing or they're the best at doing these things in music. And then you step back and say, we're just going to get entertained. And this, is, this guy is not a Christian. These, this, this, all these quotes, this guy is not a Christian to the best of my knowledge. But listen to what he says here. One has to go to a concert or a church or a musical festival to recapture the collective excitement and bonding of music. Isn't that interesting that here is a person that sees that music unites us. We are united when we start to sing. We come from different backgrounds. Some of us come from native backgrounds, white, black, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, you know, all these different backgrounds. And yet when we come together, we're all singing music, and it's uniting us. You see, it, it bonds us. In such, a, in such a situation, it says, there seems to be an actual binding of the nervous system. I thought this was fascinating. He says that there is an actual binding of our nervous, like the way that our brains are functioning. When I'm sitting with you guys, and I'm singing, and you're singing, and we're together, that there's some sort of like bonding going on in my brain with you. This is some scientific studies, but that's what they're seeing, is that there's sort of a unifying synapsis, sort of a unifying coming together in my brain with those that I'm singing with. I thought that was fascinating. I don't know about you guys, but... It says that this unification of an audience by, and they use this word, veritable neurogami. <laughs> it's a marriage of the nervous system. That basically we are uniting in our minds by singing together. By sharing in this music together. That's not if we're just listening. It doesn't happen. It happens when we sing together. When we're making melody together. You see, that's why they said that when, when in the old days, when they sang together and did these things, it was a unifying, a bonding experience. But then when you just sit back and listen, it's not as binding. And that's what happens. That's why he says you got to go to a church for this to happen again. Very interesting, right? Because some of our denominational friends, it's like they're trying to, to go back to this concert style where... You get the best up there and then you kind of sit back and listen. And this kind of seems old fashioned to some people. Like you guys sit there and read books and, you know, but in reality, wouldn't it be amazing? Shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us that God has commanded us to sing and to speak to one another and to teach one another and to encourage one another through song and that each and every one of us are commanded to do that. And what it does is it's not just singing to God, 
but it's actually helping to unify us. And we're like, wow, you mean God knew that all along? Yep. You know, I love those things where if you've ever studied something out that God doesn't always tell us why he, to do something. Like, for instance, he tells us to pray for our enemies or forgive those who have wronged us. You know, he doesn't tell us why. Well, he does. He says, I forgave you, therefore you should forgive others. But he doesn't get into all the psychology of it. But you know what? Psychologists and people will tell you that we have to be able to let that go because it's making us bitter and it emotionally and physically it starts to weigh us down. And, and we're like, oh, you mean there's other benefits of what God was telling us to do? It's like God told them to circumcise the boys on the eighth day. He didn't say why. But if you go and study it, you'll realize that the safest day to ever circumcise a boy would be on the eighth day. And so it's fascinating. God tells us to sing, to speak to one another. He doesn't always explain all of it. But here, was, isn't this amazing that if he's like, because I know it's going to bind you guys together. It's going to teach. It's going to move. It's going to inspire you. Right? People are involuntarily keeping time to music. Again, you might not know anything about music, but isn't it interesting that your foot will start to move? How is that possible? Like, I don't have any training. And yet, he, they were saying that in, in rhythm, you can go to a concert, he said, and see 15,000 people, all different, and yet when that rhythm and that starts that music starts to happen guess what all 15,000 are moving as one that's pretty amazing right it's a most amazing thing everyone is synchronized by the music but here's the caution that he also writes about these effects the overflow of music into the motor system that just as music that I start to move because of the music he says that it can easily go too far, becoming irresistible and perhaps coercive, like kind of like moving you in ways that God doesn't necessarily want you to go that way, right? So there are boundaries in, in some of this. He says that we see this coercive power of music if it is of, like he gave some examples, if it's an excessive volume, super loud, or an overwhelming beat, like kind of that hard pounding, you know, it, he says that that can start to start to get my heart moving. It can get my, my mind moving in a certain way. Like a rock concert, people as one may be taking over and engulfed or entranced, trained by this music. Like the beat of a war drum can incite extreme martial excitement and solidarity. Have you guys ever seen, um, it could be a drum or it could be, do, 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 do. What does that mean? Charge. Charge. Right? What is that? That's music that when you heard this, do, 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 it was like, okay, that, that was like this signal. That was sort of like this. Or have you guys seen in the Civil War where they would use the drums when they would uh, be marching? You know, they would, they would march with these drums. And in some of the older ones, they would use a gong or they would use sort of like a pounding drum, like we're marching just like, and you sort of get in a trance that you're marching to your death. You're marching in war, especially in the old days. I mean, it was just like facing each other and see who could shoot each other. How could you do that? They would use sometimes music. If you think about in the army, when they're marching, what do they do? I don't know, but I've been told. Do, 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 do. Right? You kind of, <laughs> yeah, right? So all of our military guys, you know, making fun of the army and making fun of whatever. But what is that? When you're marching and you have these long journeys, it's music. It's sort of almost like a trance. Like you just sort of like get into this rhythm and you're just singing and moving. There's a caution 
that he says you got to be careful because music can overpower where you're allowing these emotions and the music and you're not paying attention to your own mind, right? So we've got to be cautious. And, and we, we talk about this, that, you know, if there's certain music that might make me think a certain way, like if certain music might get me kind of angry or if certain music might make me think more sexually or if certain music might make me think more um, like greedy for something or whatever. Like there's certain musics that I have to be cautious. I have to be cautious. Music is powerful. It is a powerful tool that can be used for good or it can be used for bad. Music is just music but it depends on how it's used and so that's what I wanted to kind of show is that you know these studies and the power of drumming in cultures all over the world there's a dynamic power of this rhythm just this sort of like you just sort of get into this this thought process so music moves helps us to memorize it helps us to be unified that's from a study that is not from the Bible, but yet we're going to see that it does this. And there's really two types of music. There's really only two types of music. There's instrumental music that uses instruments of all kinds. I mean, there's, there's thousands upon thousands of instruments. And then there's a cappella, which is the voice, voice only. Now, you can combine those where sometimes there's singing and instruments or instruments only, but still, it's using instruments or voice only. That's the only two types of music that there is. Um, God has specifically commanded and he shows that a cappella, voice only, is the music that New Testament Christians worshipped with. Go to the New Testament and read it. Find out how those Christians worshipped. Every single time it will show you they sang. They spoke. There is no examples, and, and so that's the other part, is there's not even an example. There's not one example of Christians worshiping with instruments in the New Testament. Not one. Every single time it's using the voice. Instruments are not authorized by God and are never used in the New Testament to worship Him. So let's look at this then. Here's one of the places where God commands singing. He says, be filled with the Spirit. What's the command? Speaking. That's using the mouth. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What's another thing? Singing. Singing is commanded. He, nowhere does he use the word playing. Nowhere does he say play. He says, speak and sing and make melody with your what? What's the instrument that's supposed to be played? My heart. So if you imagine this like a string, it's like you're strumming your heart to produce the sound that comes out. You see, I'm the instrument. And so that's God's command to speak and to sing to one another. And this is our passage this morning is Colossians 3.16 that was already read, but he says, let the word of Christ richly or abundantly live within you. Let God, let the word of Jesus live in you. How? With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing or encouraging one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts, to God. Now I wanted to read this really quickly um, when we talk about dwelling, allowing the Word of God to dwell in our hearts. I thought this was good. I know it's a long quote, but hang with it. He says, So I say again that in order that it may dwell in you, the Word may it dwell, it must first enter you. You see, you can't let the Word live in you if you're not putting the Word into you. If I'm not allowing the Word of God into my heart and into my mind, then I can't live on it, live in it, be in it. It has to go in first. You must really know the spiritual meaning of it. You must believe that Word. You must live upon that Word. You must drink it in. 
You must let it soak into the innermost part of your being. It's not enough to have a Bible on the shelf. It is infinitely better to have its truths stored up within your soul. It's a good thing to carry your New Testament in your Bible or your Bible in your pocket. It's far better to carry its message in your heart. Amen? You've got to dwell. Let the word dwell in your hearts richly, abundantly, overflowing, more than enough that it's in me. Right? And so let's go back to music moves us. Right? Because he says that let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. And he's going to show us how. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. Now that word admonishing is to share information, to warn, to correct, to remind. It's not to necessarily punish somebody, but to influence that leads to change. So what can this music do if I'm singing that I have decided to follow Jesus? What are we saying? What are we trying to move us to do? That's follow Jesus, right? That's, that's the, that's the, that's the, using music and the words to hopefully help motivate us to admonish us because there's some things that need to change. There's some things in my heart that need to change. And that word admonish is different than teaching. They, they're similar, but you teach somebody and sometimes you need to kind of correct them. Like, hey man, what you're doing right here is not right. And we don't like that. You know, we don't like it when somebody kind of corrects us. But yet in sports, that's what it is. You know, if I teach somebody how to shoot a basketball first, I teach them, like, put your elbow in, follow through. You know, if I teach them, that's the first part. But after a little while, I notice they're over there all shooting like this, you know. Then what? Then do I just let them be or do I encourage them and re like hey remember don't don't hold it like this bring it back in line it line it up right and so now you're what are you doing you're admonishing you're encouraging them on how to do it the right way so what's one of the ways that we can admonish one another is through songs you see, through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we're encouraging, we're correcting. And so it, it motivates us to say, you're right, I need to make these changes, right? The next one is the teaching. Remember, music helps us to memorize, teaches. So teach one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What can wash away my sins? Well, can you remember? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? So if I was just, if I could get that stuck in my head as one of those memory things, right? And if I was just at work or washing dishes and I'm just sitting there, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but, right? So I could be going throughout the week, being reminded, it's stuck in my head because of the, the music. The music is sticking and it's rotating over and over and it's reminding me and helping me to focus on God. But when I'm in this assembly, I'm also singing this to each other, right? I'm singing to you and you're singing to me, what can wash away my sins? And we're all together saying, nothing but the blood. Right? We're all together in unison. We all have these different places that we're coming from, but we're all in unison, all in one mind, all in one spirit saying, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. All of us struggle with sin. All of us are coming together focusing on the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're singing it as one. And it's sticking. It's memorizing. Right? That music. 
And then, remember how I said that across all cultures, music does what? Unifies. We're teaching and admonishing one another. We're coming together. And I know that, that COVID made this, this challenging when we had to be separate, but there is nothing like coming together and we are singing and teaching and encouraging and speaking to one another. That was, I think, my hardest thing on, on COVID is, is when I was watching the screen, I could hear the sermon, but there, we didn't have the singing, right? That was, man, I missed that. You know, I really miss that singing together. That's, that's one of the aspects of worship that is valuable. It's valuable for us. So we're speaking to each other, singing to each other, teaching each other, admonishing one another. We're influencing, we're moving, we're inspiring. All of these things are coming together in song. Music moves us. It helps us to memorize the scriptures and the teachings and helps us to learn more about God through the songs. And it is unifying us. Church, we have to be here in order to participate in this part of worship. God commands it and he knows how helpful, strengthening, bonding it is for us. It is an essential part of our worship. Sometimes we're like, we'll dismiss it. I'm just there for the lesson. No, all of this works together to be part of the one body of Christ. All you got to do is go back and read the New Testament and see how they worshiped in their music. Even afterwards, you can read history books from the, those people who are the first Christians afterwards. It's not Bible, but you can go back and read how they worshiped all of them. They sang. None of them played instruments. None of them. Playing instruments is a very new part of Christian worship. It's only really come about within the last several hundred years. For thousands of years, it was always the voice. It always has been until just recently. So hold on to these. Don't think of it as old-fashioned, but rather that God knows what He is doing. And he is working through us. If you're not a Christian, then this is something that, that we try to teach us is what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood. Do you have the blood of Jesus? Because the only way to have that blood is if I believe in him, I'm willing to repent of my sins and be baptized into him. He says, I'm washed and resurrected to a new life. If you haven't done that, then today is a day that you can make that happen that you can say, I want to be right with the Lord Jesus. If you are a Christian, then he teaches us that, that we can sometimes lose sight and we need to be admonished. We need to be encouraged to come back. If there's something that maybe is not right in your life and you want to come forward and let us know so we can pray for you, please, let's do that together. We stand and sing at this time.